So the judicial system is the system that handles judicial stuff. Really? Okay. So when we talked about our, our Cabbage Island, it sounds like some kind of strange new reality ship. Welcome <laughs> to Cabbage Island. <laughs> All right, so when we talked about our our, uh, our cabbage island, we had to have different sort of branches of government, okay? We had a branch of government that created laws. And in our case, since it was such a small community, it could just be all of us voting, like one vote per person. We didn't need a representative government. Um, if, it, you know, if our cabbage island grew to 200 million people, it'd be really hard to have everybody get together and vote on every issue. So probably for you know, each million of us or something, we would elect someone to represent that million people, right? And then they would go and, and that's how we do things here. So that was a legislative branch. Legislatures create laws, okay? Um, and then we had a sheriff. Where's our sheriff? Oh, there's the sheriff. Howdy, sheriff. So, and the sheriff, their job is not to create laws and not even to decide if the laws are fair. We're seeing a lot of that going on right now, right? Where sheriffs are like, well, we're just not going to enforce that. You know? But that's really not their job. That's my sheriff. Like, hey, I'm a sheriff. We just choose not to enforce it. Okay. And while executive branches do have to have some sort of discretion, they can't, honestly, there's so many laws, they have to kind of decide these ones are really what we're going to focus our energy on, right? And so that's what we see, like when, when a state will pass like a new gun law, right? And say it's against the law to have a, a, a gun that's a certain way. There's a lot of county sheriffs just going like, we're just not going to put a lot of energy into enforcing that, you know? And you see that with marijuana laws in places where it's still illegal. You have a lot of local law enforcement people just being like, we're going to expend energy on, you know, other things. So that's an executive branch. The executive branch executes or ensures that the laws which are passed by the legislature are actually followed, okay? And then we had this issue of when we locked Boaz up for too long and it didn't seem fair, right? The question was, okay, well, what does the law actually say? And the law didn't prescribe terms. And so the judicial branch, where we hired a small group of us to make decisions about, well, what does the law really mean? And can he challenge that portion of the law? And is that fair? That was the judicial branch. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is this judicial system, um, how that system works in the, in the United States federal government and at the state level. Okay. So, oh. I never get that right. I'm a little slow. Worst things would be a little slow. All right. So at the so there's two types of courts in our system. Okay. The first are called trial courts. That's where cases begin. Juries hear cases. You always see these on TV, right? Like, um, and then usually there's a single judge presiding over a case at a trial court. The judge doesn't usually make the decision in the case, the jury does, okay? So that is a trial court. The other types of courts in our system are called appellate courts, where we can appeal certain decisions. What that means is if there was an error that occurred in a trial court, we can appeal on the basis of that error and then an appellate court can look at that appeal and they can either say like, yes, that's a meaningful appeal uh, or no, it wasn't. If they decide, yes, it was a meaningful appeal, they can either throw out the case altogether and just say, nope, the trial court made an error. Or they can say the trial court made an error, but it was only kind of significant. So let's send it back to the trial court to handle and they can redo that part they made an error on. Um, or they can say the trial court didn't err, right? Like your appeals denied because you were rightfully convicted in that trial court, okay? Um, oftentimes, so they don't have trials in appellate courts. It's not like the things you see on TV. Instead, what you do is you submit, both sides in an appeal will submit all of their information to the appellate court. 
and the appellate court will read all that information. And then they'll have what they call oral arguments, where each side will come and sort of present their case. And the judges will often ask questions or even give, they call them hypotheticals. Well, what if this? Well, what if that? And then after that, the appellate court sort of issues their ruling. So it's a little bit different than a trial type system. So we have both of these in our system, trial courts and appellate courts. All right. I feel like I'm, we're looking at the wrong thing here. In a second, let me double check something. I may have... Oh, yes, we're good. Mm -hmm. I thought I added one more slide in there for a second. I wanted to talk about. All right. So this process where we can appeal things is called judicial review. Okay. What it means is we recognize that our court system is imperfect. I think whoever thought that up was really brilliant, right? To recognize we're going to make errors. So there should be a process to review things rather than just being like, sorry, some dude made a decision. So you're screwed, right? Like, so like I said, this is kind of what they do. They determine whether an error was made. They review the transcript, other evidence is reviewed. And then this says parties submit written briefs. And then occasionally they'll have, like I said, oral arguments as well. So all of those things is how they review it. And like I said, after the appellate court reviews it, they can either affirm it, saying the decision of the lower court was right. So we affirm that decision, meaning it still stands. They can reverse it, which means, nope, they made an error at the lower court, reversed. Usually what they'll do is reverse, and then the lower court can decide, is this something we want to Try to retry, things like that. Okay. Remand means the error requires further proceedings. So sometimes they will reverse and remand, meaning we reverse it and now they need to take it back up at the lower court or they might modify it. That happens a lot like in damage awards. So, like you sue me because I, you know, I was negligent and I crashed into your house and caused damage. And the court awards me, or the trial court says, okay, you have to pay the cost of fixing Boaz's house, but then you also have to give him $10 million because of the pain and suffering of having his damaged house. And I appeal, a lot of times the, the, uh, um, when I appeal, the appellate court will be like, okay, yeah, you did, you did damage his house, you need to pay repair, to repair his house, but that damage or the, the, the pain and suffering award is extreme. And so, you know, they'll cap it. You know, they'll say, you know, the most, if nobody was hurt, nothing else, repair his house and then pay him an extra $100,000 and it's all good or whatever. So that's what they mean by modifying. They'll change the lower court ruling. At which point Boaz could either accept it or he could then appeal and say, that's BS. I had 10 million coming to me. You know, and then you have to confer with his lawyers and they'd have to say, is this something that we really could do or not? Um, So the other thing they can do is they can look at how the lower court interpreted a statute, okay? Like I said, statutes are laws. And so you and I can read the same law and come up with a little something different, right? We can argue about it. It's kind of like, you know, there's lots of things like that. You know, if you try to read uh, a verse out of the Bible, two people could read it and have a very different understanding of what it means, right? And so... That's another thing they can review is they can say, hey, the court, the, the lower court applied this statute in this way. Does that seem consistent with how other courts have applied that statute? Or are they doing something totally left field on the, you know, totally different? All right. And sometimes, yeah, they'll even determine the scope of the statute. They'll just be like, no, the law doesn't, wasn't ever meant to reach that far. Whoa. I hit the wrong button. We learned about this, I think, in the first chapter. It's called the Doctrine of Stere Decisis. Um, and that's a Latin term. And all that term means is let the decision stand. 
So that doctrine says that when we do judicial review, when an appellate court hears a case, they should compare it against other decisions that have already been made. And if they're substantially the same, they should stick with other decisions that have been made that way. In other words, the law should have consistency to it. So they'll follow previous decisions. And this is a term you'll need to know. Previous decisions from other courts are called precedent. That's a term that you'll hear come up. You also see it like in court shows, if you ever watch like uh, Law and Order or something, right? Precedent just means this has already been decided. It's a precedent. It precedes this thing that we're doing now. It was done before. All right. So who are the parties in a court case? We have a plaintiff and a defendant. The plaintiff is the person who starts the lawsuit. It is some, some states call them petitioners, okay? So either the plaintiff, meaning they're, they're complaining, they're making the complaint to the court and asking the court to do something on their behalf. Um, and then there's a defendant and they're the person who has being either sued or who is having charges placed against them. And it says it's the party named in the suit for recovery. What that means is if they decide in favor of the defendant, they're going to get recovery, which is usually a financial award of some sort. So just remember the plaintiff brings the suit, sues the other person, the defendant is the person being sued by the other person. In criminal cases, you might know who the plaintiff would be. Yeah, and who's that? The law? The government, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right, yeah. So the plaintiff in criminal cases is the government. And usually they get listed as the people, since the government represents the people. So like if, if I'm being you know tried for a criminal, a crime, it's going to be the people versus Mike Fox. And I'll be the defendant because I'm being sued, in this case, criminally charged by the people or the government, okay? Um, and so in a civil case, it'll be usually two people or two businesses suing each other. In a criminal case, it's the government bringing suit against somebody else. Shouldn't they say like the plaintiff finds you guilty, it means that the government finds you guilty? Yeah, if they say the, if the plaintiff is found guilty? Yeah. yeah. Well, plaintiffs aren't usually found guilty. Yeah, I mean, the plaintiff is just the person who is suing another person. Okay. Um, all right. So we know who is suing whom. The plaintiff is suing the defendant. Or if it's the government, then the, the government is the plaintiff and they're bringing a criminal suit against the defendant. But then the question is, which court has a right to hear the case? In other words, if I'm here in Grand County and I steal something, I get charged with theft, where will my trial be? Probably the Graham County Superior Court, right? They have jurisdiction over this area. Jurisdiction just means the authority to hear a case. Usually it's pretty straightforward. If you commit a crime in a certain area, then whatever court has jurisdiction over that area can hear the case. But sometimes it's not so easy, especially in civil suits. What if I sue somebody who lives in Florida? Well, is it Florida courts hear the case or is it Arizona courts that hear the case? Oh, yeah. Because if you think about it, whoever has to travel. So if, if I sue somebody who lives in Florida and I can say that I'm suing them in Arizona and they have to fly here and get a lawyer who knows Arizona law, he's at a real disadvantage to have to keep traveling back and forth. The costs could really mount up for that person. And so a lot of court cases become about this jurisdiction before they ever get to talking about what the actual, they call it the subject matter, what we're suing them about. There's a big fight about, well, what court's gonna hear the case? 
because it can really make a big difference. And then the international law is even bigger, right? If the, if the Mexican government charges me with something and I'm here in, in, in the United States, can they compel me or force me to go to Mexico to stand trial? Probably, but it, it, you know, there's going to, it's going to depend on a lot. And a lot of times there'll be this protracted, you know, long drawn out legal fight about whether or not, you know, the Mexican government can extradite me to Mexico. Or even, even harder, if a Mexican citizen sues me in Mexican court. And I'm just like, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna appear. <laughs> what are you gonna do about it? I'm not breaking any laws. You know, so that becomes a real issue. So jurisdiction is about who has authority to hear the case. And it's broken into two types of things. The first is called subject matter jurisdiction. Meaning some courts are limited in their scope and can only hear limited types of cases. For example, if you get a, uh, you know, a, a ticket for speeding, you go to in this in this community, you go to a, a it's called a justice court that's presided over by a justice of the peace, an elected magistrate, um, and that's who's going to hear that case. But if you murder somebody, that won't be handled. They can't hear, you know, they can hear things on like civil fines and and petty theft, like shoplifting, but they, they don't have authority to hear like a murder case. And in our community, it'd be, it would be the, the, gem, the, the Graham County Superior Court is who would hear a murder case. That'd be our local court that has that jurisdiction over that subject matter. Would that also be like with city-wise, like if um, like let's say something happens in like Phoenix, uh -huh. and then when you live here, uh -huh. Would which place would have jurisdiction? Like if you're trying to sue like your landlord uh -huh. for something, um, would you have to go to like Phoenix and do that because the residence is in Phoenix? Probably. Okay. You could try to make an argument, but you'd have there's pretty it's, it's well established that that's the norm that the place where the event occurred, mm -hmm. you know, the the landlord didn't fix the house and then it damaged my property when the roof leaked or something whatever right so the place where that happened is going to have the, the jurisdiction okay. so you would have a hard time compelling them to come to graham county to have that hurt um you could try but probably it would just get thrown out you'd get, pay your lawyer even more to have filed that request <laughs> right um and then the other is called with in personam jurisdiction which is what we're kind of describing is is which court has has authority over the in persona means the the, the persons involved, which has to do with where they live and where the activity occurred. All right, and so we'll talk a little bit more about jurisdiction later. Um, it's one of those things that like, when you're not doing law stuff, you don't even think that much about it. And not realizing it takes up a huge amount of time and energy in the court system, just finding and figuring out who has the authority to hear this case, all right? So our federal court system is created this way. I'm actually gonna go from the bottom up down at the bottom are what are called specialty courts. And specialty courts are these courts, sometimes they're called courts of limited jurisdiction. They can only hear limited types of cases. So, you know, like a bankruptcy court can only hear bankruptcy claims. That's the only law they deal with. They can't do like a murder trial. Or if I'm suing you because I think that you, you know, screwed me over in a business deal. That's not handled in bankruptcy court. Only bankruptcies are handled there. So that's the specialty courts. And then above them, not even above them, we'll say the lowest court uh, in the federal system is called a federal district court. And they are, we'll call those, they call them courts of original jurisdiction. It's where the cases start, okay? In the United States, our federal district courts are geographic. So their jurisdiction is based on over a geographic area. I don't know the exact number. I think there's something like 94 or 95 district, federal districts. Um, each state has at least one, and then some big states have multiple districts in them. Okay. So if you were going to sue somebody in, about a federal issue, so if they, you know, if they violated your civil rights uh, or if they committed a federal crime against you or something, that that and the federal government were charging you with it, that'd be handled in federal district court. And then if once it's settled there and you appeal, it would go to the U.S. Court of Appeals. 
that is broken into what they call circuits. I, I think the history is in the olden days, the, the appeals court judges would actually like travel. There's only 13 of them in the US, so they would travel to like different places to hear cases there and so it was a, a circuit. But now, uh, now the circuits are just, they're still called circuits. Um, we're part of the, I think the seventh circuit here. Oh, I better double check that, but I think it's the seventh circuit, which is headquartered out of San Francisco. So if you were going to appeal a case, a federal case that happened in, a, in an Arizona federal district court, you'd have to go to the seventh or ninth? I think seventh. I think so too. Um, but anyway, Court of Appeals. And then above them is the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court, they have ultimate jurisdiction, meaning an well, ultimate sort of decision making. But like once they say it, that's it. There's nowhere to appeal to beyond that. But you know, the process of say something starting here and then being appealed to there and then being appealed to there is like years and years. It would take you 10 years to get that whole thing settled. Paying a lawyer the whole time. So you really don't want to do that if you can avoid it, right? You'd rather get it handled at the lowest level and done. In fact, what you'd really like to do in real life is settle things without ever have to go to go to court. That's why they do settlements so often, because it's super expensive to hire a team of lawyers and litigate all the way up the chain to the Supreme Court. Much easier if it's like, hey, I know you and I had this disagreement about me damaging your house. You think the damage was 100,000 and I think it was 50,000. Can we just like, can we settle on 75? And you're like, yeah, okay. Or whatever, that's done. We could do that without lawyers. Um, or if we wanted to, we could have lawyers, but you know what I mean? That's way cheaper and way quicker. So there's our federal court system in the United States. And then we have a state court system uh, in Arizona. It starts with a general trial court so most things that originate in the general trial court um, in Arizona, they call them um, superior courts. I don't know why it's called that. That makes it sound like they're really high up or something. But, but that's the, that is the first court you would go to for anything that wasn't a specialty or a lesser thing. So you know the lesser courts would be things like small claims court, justice of the peace, City courts, like if you if you got a ticket in the city of Safford, you'd go to the city magistrate's court, right? All of that sort of stuff. Probate are um, are courts that handle like when somebody dies and people are trying to figure out where their stuff goes, right? That's what probate court is. So they handle a really specifically narrow part, um, and that's why people leave wills. So the probate court can look at that and be like, oh, well, this person spelled out exactly what they want. That's easy, done. It's harder when somebody with lots of assets dies, it's called intestate, without a will, and has not stated what their wishes are, and everybody's fighting over it, right? That's when it becomes a real problem that probate courts have to make those decisions. Um, anyway, so superior courts, and then we have a state court of appeals, and then a state supreme court. And if you were to, if, if you were to go all the way up that chain, and the state Supreme Court made a ruling, you can have one more appeal, and that would be to the United States Supreme Court. So you can, they can not only, not only hear cases that come out of the US Court of Appeals, but they can also hear cases that come out of state Supreme Courts, okay? We actually have a case, uh, we'll have to check it out at some point, that happened, uh, a girl named Savannah Redding, who's probably, in her 30s now, she's not a girl anymore, she's an adult woman, sued the Safford Unified School District and it went all the way to the US Supreme Court. Have you ever heard of this case, Reading the Safford Unified School District? Here. Maybe, no, I've heard my dad talk about it. Okay. Tell us the story. I'll tell you a little story. It's interesting. So, Savannah Reading, middle school student at Safford Middle School, she, uh, she was a normal student, had normal grades. You know, she wasn't like a troublemaker or anything. Anyway, so someone came to the principal's office and said, hey, I saw Savannah Redding giving uh, ibuprofen to people. I, have, I learned about this. Okay. And 
you know, the school has a rule that's like you can't hand out any pills because they can't tell if it's ibuprofen or if it's some other drug make it look like ibuprofen. I think it's a reasonable rule to be like, if you need medicine, go to the nurse and the nurse will give you ibuprofen. And they have a little thing from your parents saying, I allow my child to get this kind of medicine if they need it, right? So, so anyway, so the, the assistant principal calls her into the office and says, hey, someone said they saw you giving out pills. And she says, well, I didn't give anybody pills. And he says, well, um, someone said they saw it. Let me see your backpack. And he searches her backpack. Mm. Mm, already, right? Didn't find. didn't find anything. So determined, he says, you know, turn out your pockets. You know, so you flip the pocket inside out to prove there's nothing in there. Turns out her pockets. Nothing. So then he, he calls in the school nurse and the secretary, two women, and they go into the nurse's office and they have her stripped down to her underwear, her bra and her panties, pull out the band on her bra all the way around to see if anything falls out and pull out the waistband on her panties all the way around to see if anything falls out. Because I guess you can tuck stuff in an elastic, right? Girls store stuff in their bra, I know this. <laughs> they're like, hey, can I use your phone? And they're like, here. <laughs> All right, it's gross. I just got recorded saying blue sweat. Fired again. All right, <laughs> it's a real issue in Arizona, right? You know this. Okay. Anyway, so they find nothing. They let her get dressed, send her back to class, send her home. Her mom finds out about this and is. Pissed, right? Yeah, lit it. That's a nicer term. Without any nope. So, mom calls around and it's like the school's just like, well, we're just trying to protect students, right? And and so they they get the the American Civil Liberties Union (ACLU) involved. They're this kind of organization that often litigates these sorts of things because they have lots of resources where individuals would not have the money it takes to sue the school. And the school won't settle. The school's just like, nope, we need to, it's we need to be able to protect students. And so they so they actually went to um, they started in federal district court. This was a civil rights case about her civil rights being violated, her right to privacy. Um, and so it was handled in federal court. The the federal district court sided with the school and said. Schools need to be able to keep people safe. And if they have a kid that they think is pushing drugs, then they need to be able to make sure they're not. And so uh, the ACLU and Savannah Redding appealed to the federal appeals court. They agreed with the district court. So they appealed to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court said, you went too far. You violated the Fifth Amendment of the United States, the right of people to be secure in their properties and persons, right? Um, and so it's kind of a landmark case in the sense that now every member of this doctrine of stare decisis, once that decision's made by the Supreme Court, now every other school, believe it or not, all almost all school districts, any big organizations, they sort of like subscribe to like they usually have a lawyer that, that's on retainer. And, and the lawyers will put out these things saying, okay, a decision was just passed by the Supreme Court that's going to change the way you handle discipline with students or whatever, right? So they're constantly getting updates saying, so now because that case was made, schools don't ever do like strip searches because this wasn't the first time this happened. Not, I mean, maybe at Safford it was, but it's happened at other schools, right? I'm curious what your thoughts are. How do you think the school could have handled that better? Yeah. I think that they like sure search her, like they do have a right to search her, but I think that they should have called her parents before. Okay. Because like I've learned even at like Thatcher when I went to high school there, they have no right to even go through your backpack if, if you're a minor to go through any of your things without your parents there. Well, without some clear and compelling interest. But in other words, and this is what the court said. They said, you know, you've got a way the danger to the other students against this person's right, the privacy. So like if someone says, I saw her with a gun in that bag, then- Well, that happened to me, Mom. Yeah, 
Someone, yeah. With all the yeehaws, they just have guns all the time. Yes, but some middle schooler was like, I saw a gun. This kid had a gun, and we had a whole lockdown because this kid thought he saw a gun. Right. Right. That was was the punctuate the gun issue. Uh, No, so, but you can see how the, the, you know, if you think of it like on the, the sliding scale, I saw this kid, and the other person said, I saw her giving out ibuprofen. Like someone had a headache, she gave them some. That, the danger that presents to the rest of the school is one thing that may warrant calling her in and saying, hey, someone said they saw you doing this. Are you giving out ibuprofen? You know, okay, well, remember it's against the rules. Or maybe even saying, you know, someone saw you doing this, and so, you know, we're going to call your mom, and she's going to come down here and, and, and take you home for the day or whatever. I don't, you know, I, but then, like, if someone says, I saw a gun, the, the amount of danger that poses to everyone else could ratchet up the response appropriately. Honestly, but you're right. Like it was, it was an excessive response, and that's what the court said. Like you strip searched. You know, think and think of how maybe you guys weren't this way, but when I was middle school age, think of how uncomfortable you are with your body. Like being made to strip down in front of everybody, that would be pretty traumatic. Like super traumatic, actually. I think for most of us. You know, that was what I was like to like wear a t-shirt to go swimming because you know, or whatever. Um, I think if you really think someone's got illegal contraband on them, call the cops. Well, yeah, I mean, if they really thought that she was like dealing hard drugs at like what 14, probably, yeah, Safford then Middle School, they right? should have called the cop. Like they have dogs that they use to search lockers. Why couldn't they use it to search for? Yeah, well, like cops are trained to know when's an appropriate time within the law to search and when not probably with a minor the cops would get there and be like let's call your mom in right and then we can have a conversation with the school administrator the police officer the parent and the child all together saying and even because i think even for like a lot of kids say she wants to be a high program i don't know that would probably scare her enough (laughs) having all of that even if that was the only, there was no punishment, just like, that, like, whoa, I gave out someone some of my ibuprofen and like everybody freaked out. I won't do that again. You know, just like a whole conversation about here's why we can't do it. I know you're just giving out ibuprofen, but we don't know the difference between that and if it's real pills. That would probably be a good educational experience for the kid instead of a lawsuit that costs the school district millions and millions of dollars to defend. A district that doesn't have that much money anyway, right? <laughs> And it's just fascinating case. Um, in, just fascinating in the sense that, like, in retrospect, you could see, how, like, how obviously bad that decision was. But apparently, this assistant principal in the moment was like, I can't let this kid go back out there if they have drugs. So, so I was the assist- assistant principal? Uh-huh. What the principal say about it? I don't know. I don't... They didn't even get fired? No. Not for strip searching and middle school girl. In their in their defense, they did have the girl nurses strip search. Yes, so it wasn't like which is better, right. but still not. Well, and, okay. and I think the reason they weren't fired is clearly, if it had to go all the way to the Supreme Court, there wasn't existing um, what would you call it, existing precedent on this, and so they were just making their decision. And you also have to remember that from 19 whatever this was i think it was around 99 to now ideas about individuals sort of like the sanctity of individuals right and especially with kids has really really changed like like a lot like when i was in school we still got paddled and spanked right like that was normal um and like if the teacher was like there's drugs in your locker then like they search your locker not like you need to make sure that, but part of it is the writing case, right? The schools have all had to become more like, whoa, we don't want to get in trouble. So now they'll get school resource officers, right? So they have a cop right there that they can refer to. All right. Anyway, that was kind of long, but I hope it was interesting. Um, it's always interesting uh, when the when the law gets. I don't know. It's actually terrifying if you're not if you're not if you're not a lawyer and you're in trouble enough that there's like lawyers involved. That's some scary stuff. All right. So personal or in personam jurisdiction typically comes from presence in the state. So for individuals, that means where they live. For corporations, it means where they're incorporated. 
often we have something called volunteer jurisdiction. So like my earlier example, when I said like, if I sue somebody in Florida or you sue somebody in Florida, and the person in Florida says, I agree to have our court, our case heard in Arizona, then that's easy. You're asking for it to be heard in Arizona, they agree to it, it's volunteer. Often when you sign a contract, it will state where, where a dispute will be heard in the contract. Like if you signed a contract for your cell phone service, somewhere in all that small print is like any legal cases will be heard in the state courts of you know California or whatever. And so that's a form of volunteer jurisdiction. A lot of times people don't realize they agree to that until like something bad comes up where they think they're gonna have to sue and then they're like, oh, I did agree to, to have our, our, our case heard in California or whatever. Uh, and then ownership of property within the state. So that's another thing that can lead to that court having jurisdiction there. That's kind of what I just said. This is an interesting one right here, minimum contacts, which is kind of a relatively new legal doctrine. Um, so for example, if I create a website, and I'm selling products on my website. My business is based here in Arizona. I'm shipping stuff everywhere in the world. Am I doing business in those other places? Not yeah. really. My only presence there is via the internet, right? And so that has become a stickier situation. So the idea is if we have, they call these long arm statutes, a lot of states have now, because all of these questions started arising in the, I will say the late 80s, early 90s, as internet e-commerce became a growing thing, states actually wrote statutes that said, in essence, if you do business with a member of our state, you're subject to our jurisdiction. And so now if I'm Amazon, I have to be prepared to defend myself against lawsuits in the courts of all 50 states and in the courts of of other other countries even right and so that can become very expensive for what for amazon or walmart or whoever's doing it but they can afford it more than you can right they're slightly richer than you jeff bezos all right we're about we have about five minutes um but actually if yeah i don't think we have the time to do that but uh uh, there's this, yeah. but that's okay because instead of this, we got to talk about the Reading case, which is fascinating to me. This is that is so local. I actually know the vice the yeah. assistant principal. Yeah. I know him really well. And he was my vice principal when I went to that school. Well, you know, nobody likes their yeah. school vice yeah. principal. That's the guy you go to get in trouble. So uh, anyway, so this is a case about these two guys. One of them's from Mexico, one's from the United States. They decide to start a business together. Um, and the guy from Mexico tells his friend from the United States, hey, I have this license to sell Lamborghini branded products. So we can make shirts, we could sell, they like made cigars. Oh, like, so like the cigar box had like the Lamborghini like thing, I guess that's fancy or whatever. What's that? Like, yeah, see? And so, so they start this business and they make all this Lamborghini branded stuff and they're selling it to people. Well, guess what? He didn't have a license from Lamborghini to use their, their trademark. So Lamborghini, the corporation, Automobili Lamborghini, a corporation of Italy, uh, sues them. And so the guy in the US is like, oh, I was acting on the fact that this dude said, yeah, we, we had a license. And they're like, yeah, that's not, you should have found out. That's, that's on you. But the guy in Mexico says, um, says like, uh, so they brought suit in the United States of America. And the guy from Mexico says, I'm not going to show up. You can't compel me to come to America to be this case, to, to, to do this case. Um, because my only presence in America has been virtual, right? It's been online. I never have come up there to do business. I was partners with this guy. I was sort of producing the stuff down in Mexico with, with the cheaper labor. And then we were shipping it to America. And this guy was doing all the selling and marketing of it in America. Uh, or I mean, it was online, but 
Anyway, so that's how they were doing it. Um, and like I said, we don't have time. It's in the book in, in section 3.6, the whole case. But in essence, the court said, um, no, you have sufficient contacts in America that you're doing business in America. And they were able to compel him in connection with the Mexican government, right, to come and defend his case and, and have to pay out the and I think all Lamborghini was trying to do was get them to cease and desist, actually, which means you don't have to pay us any money, just stop using our logo and all that stuff. Anyway, interesting stuff. We're out of time. I hope I hope it was interesting. And I hope you have a great day. And sorry we had to move classes and then log into the computer and log out of the computer and log into the computer. But that was just my gift to you. To you. Yeah. Please. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, uh, yeah. See you guys. Have a great day. So I actually have a, I guess, a more of a personal question. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, 